Hey guys, welcome to another Reaper blog tutorial. Today we're talking about what's new in Reaper 6.04, just released last Friday. We're also gonna go back to a couple of little things from uh, 6.02 and 6.03 that haven't been covered on the blog before. If you're new around here, welcome. I really hope you'll subscribe. And if you like my content, consider being a patron on Patreon or a member here on YouTube. All right, so let's dig into the change log and see some interesting new things in Reaper. And first up, we've got an option to support dark mode in 10.14. This is an experimental option. It's not recommended that you necessarily use it, but uh, it's a step in the right direction to supporting this function. It actually doesn't work on my system, but I will show you how to set it up. So going into the Reaper preferences, going to the general page, clicking on Advanced UI System Tweaks. And in here, click this button to allow 10.14 dark mode. And it warns you that this may not be compatible with all your plugins and things like that. Um, it also requires a restart. So we're going to save those preferences, quit Reaper. In System Preferences, we're just going to assign dark mode in the general page. So that swaps the light for dark colors in most of macOS's UI. And uh, now going into Reaper, we'll see that a lot of the things have been uh, swapped as well. So a light gray for a dark gray, things like that. So the title bar here is darker. Uh, you can't see the menus in my screen capture, uh, but they are dark with white text. Uh, I'll show you what the preferences now looks like. A lot of people really enjoy this new dark mode style. I'll show you what the uh, item properties looks like. And I am using the Reaper 6 default theme. Um, so this will look a little bit different depending on what theme you're using. So my theme has it a little bit darker, but, um, but in general, it's going to look darker overall with and more more similar to the style of the rest of Mac OS. So I mentioned that this doesn't actually work on my system. I have a kind of an older MacBook Pro now, and I'll show you here what happens. I've got no moving cursor, or it, it updates extremely slowly. The counter works, but the um, things like the meters don't update. And yeah, it's it's not good, uh, at least on my system, it's not working. And so I'm going to go back to turning this option off and restarting. Because I'm not a Reaper developer, I don't mind showing you when these things don't actually work and warning you when you know things will potentially have some problems for you. Up next, we're looking at MIDI editor sync time base to a range view without recentering. This is again from 6.02, and this is something that has annoyed me for a really long time. I like the project sync mode in the MIDI editor, but it doesn't work if you're using two monitors left and right. It really only works, or it used to only work if you had the MIDI editor docked directly below the arrange view. So we can change the time base for the MIDI editor. There are several different options. That's in the view menu and it's piano roll time base. So project beats is the default. Um, your ruler for bars and beats will match your projects bars and beats ruler. There's source beats where the start of the MIDI item will always have beat one as the beginning. There's project time, which uses a uh, minutes and seconds based ruler. And there's project synced, which will also link your zoom setting. So as I zoom out my project, my MIDI editor zooms as well. And it tries to keep that MIDI item in view. Up until this update, it used to be that moving this MIDI editor around would kind of recenter this contents so that the play cursor was aligned. And that would only work if the MIDI editor was directly below your main arrange view. If you had the MIDI editor floating on a second monitor, this mode would be impossible to use because it would constantly recenter. There's no way that the 
edit cursor could be aligned on both screens. It just would never show you your contents. Even if you did have it docked, if you had something like the uh, Media Explorer over here or the effects, an effects chain or something like that, it would be impossible for these to stay synced because this would change the offset. And so you'd have something that was all uh, squished on one side and it just didn't work. I'm so happy that they fixed that because this is an excellent way of working with MIDI. Going back to Reaper 6.03, there's a new option to prevent mouse edits of single CC events from moving past other CC events. So let's put in some pitch CCs right here. I'm gonna put one there, put one in there, one in there. No, it, it doesn't really matter where they go. I'm just putting in a couple. So this new option, you can find it in a couple different places. First place is in Preferences and uh, MIDI Editor. And this toggle, I believe it's off by default, prevent mouse edits of single CC events from moving past other events. So we'll just turn that off. We can also find it in the action list for the MIDI editor. So we're just going to search for prevent and we'll find that here. Prevent mouse edits of single CC events from moving past other CC events. And we can see that the toggle state is off. So when this is off, this is the default behavior. This is how it's been um, for as long as we've had um, envelopes for CC events. And if we drag this over, you can see that those positions swapped and it totally changed the automation of the CC events from multiple points as you were dragging. And that is usually not the intended behavior. So now we have this option and I'll just enable it here. And so now when I drag this envelope point to the left, it just gets stuck right there. And so I can only go uh, change the, the value, but I cannot change the position past where this envelope point is. So if you want really steep, sharp angles, quick changes for these things, then now it is possible. One more quick thing in MIDI editor CC lanes. If you double click on the CC lane header, I guess you would call it this empty area on the left, double click it, and that will select all the points in the envelope. And so that's very similar to how things work in the range view. If you have an automation lane open like this, I've got some points here. None of them are selected. I can double click, I will select all the points. And it's really the same as with tracks because I can double click and select all the items. So once again, double clicking in a CC lane header will select all the points, um, whether that's velocity, pitch, or any other CCs. So now we're into Reaper 6.04, and the first thing we'll look at is for automation. Add actions to move active envelope fader or selected envelope points up or down a tiny bit. So it's not really clear what a tiny bit actually means, but these are the actions here. Automation lane, decrease active fader a tiny bit, and increase fader a tiny bit, move selected points down a tiny bit, and move selected points up a tiny bit. In this case, fader means this knob on the envelope panel. So if I run decrease a tiny bit, that's done a tenth of a dB. So you would need to run this 10 times to decrease this by one dB. Previously, there were actions like these move items envelope points down one track slash a bit. Now these work in one dB increments on a volume control. Uh, these tiny ones do a 10th of a dB. Now there's also these move selected points down a tiny bit action. So I'll just, I'm gonna draw in something here and make sure that they are selected. I run this action, move selected points down a tiny bit. And so that's, that's moving them about a 20th of a, uh, of a dB, still a very tiny amount. Uh, so yeah, so basically this decrease a tiny bit for the fader, this is the entire track. The other ones just do the selected points. I'm not 100% sure what the purpose of those is. Why do you need to edit in such small amounts uh, in this method? 
but it is possible to use these in custom actions. So it could be that some sort of larger action, these become very important. Next, we're going to look at some new additions to automation items. The first being a sign shape, and the second is a tilt parameter. So but we didn't have a sign parameter before. We actually had a uh, parametric shape. It's similar to a sine wave, but is a little bit kind of fatter on the uh, on the top. And if we go to sign shape, it's a little bit um, more even all the way through. Volume envelopes can look a little bit strange because there's such a huge range of, of values available. So this point here kind of looks a bit weird. It's kind of a compressed view of the actual values. So ignore that part. So I'm gonna increase the number of cycles for this LFO and then adjust the tilt control. And so this tilts the entire thing up or down Really cool to be able to do that. Um, and you can flip this around by using the amplitude control. This, along with the frequency skew and the amplitude skew, makes for some really interesting LFO shapes. Up next, we're gonna look at a change to custom actions. Add option to define when custom action toolbars and menu items are displayed as enabled. And this is related to a change from 6.03, show custom action toggle state as enabled slash disabled if all component actions that report a toggle state are enabled or disabled. So that just basically means that this state column in the action list uh, will show whether an action is on or off if all the actions inside are enabled or disabled. And menu items and toolbar buttons will also show the toggle state. I don't think I have an action that makes use of that, but I'll just show you one random one here, uh, just so you can see the new functions at the bottom of the custom action window. So this toggle, show as active if all component actions are active or active or unknown, doesn't matter. So this toggle is now active by default, and I don't think there's really any downside to that, to have that active. Basically, if you're making custom actions and you need them to be toggles, it's important to uh, to have that set the right way, uh, especially custom actions used in other custom actions where it needs to check toggle states and things like that. So this kind of seems like a pretty minor change, but potentially this can open up a lot of options for custom actions. There are a couple of updates to the Retune plugin. Allow detection on very low pitches, G minus one to A zero with large window size. And window size is this function here uh, on the first page, the retune tuner page. And the other function is limiting the output note range in automatic tuning mode. So we're gonna go to the correction tab. And in here we've got maximum and minimum pitch. So we can choose a maximum note and it shows the note plus the actual uh, frequency in Hertz. So let's say limit it to C4 as well as minimum pitch of, of uh, D1, let's say. And then it's not going to automatically shift something into the wrong octave, that sort of thing. And of course, narrow this down to as small of a range as possible for your vocal, and you'll get much better quality. You're not gonna have those strange notes that jump out of the octave and things like that. It's really cool to see Retune getting a little bit of an update. Next up is something that affects all projects, store a range view Y scroll position in project. So that just means what track is visible at the top of the project. Basically, where is the scroll bar? That's going to be stored inside of the project when you save. So right now I'm saving this project with number 18 at the top and I'm gonna hit save. I'm gonna close the project and then reopen the project. And as expected, I have number 18 at the top. Before this update, you would end up with track one at the top, which when you have a really large project, you know that's another little thing that's gonna slow you down. A lot of people are saying that this is a big deal for their big orchestral projects and things like that. Just in general, it's a great idea to have the project open up exactly as you left it. Next, we have an action that affects items and editing. When enabled, trim behind duplicated media items immediately after duplicating. So I've got a MIDI item here 
Uh, let's give this a color. There we go. And I'm going to duplicate this item like that. Now I'm going to split this item here and give it a unique color, right? And now I'm going to duplicate this a couple times and you'll see what happens. It used to be that if you were duplicating something really quickly, it would sometimes miss uh, removing one of these pink items behind. And um, so now that's automatic and I can duplicate over items and not have to worry about things like that. So I'm gonna uh, take this color and give this one a unique color. And I'm gonna drag just a section over and now it is automatically erasing what is behind the item very quickly. It's not going to get caught um, with the drag duplicating or with the action to duplicate. This looks completely different if you have trim content behind media items turned off from the options menu. This is also in the media item defaults, trim content behind media items when editing. So those two options are the exact same thing. Um, I'm also going to turn on show overlapping media in lanes. So once again, I'll just color this a certain way. So this is unique. If I drag over here, it's it's not removing that other item. And if I if I duplicate, it's just stacking them on top of each other, and that is a complete mess. I always recommend having trim content behind media items on. Um, because that just makes things so much simpler because you never get items that are stacked up on top of each other. So the last thing we're going to talk about today is some mouse modifiers for looping items. This is really cool stuff. So I've got an item here and it is looping. Here's how it sounds. Okay, so now let's look in the mouse modifiers to see some of these new things. Preferences, editing and behavior, most modifiers. I'm at media item bottom half and left drag, and I've assigned command control to move loop section contents ignoring snap. So that looks like this. When I hold down command and control, I can adjust the contents of this loop by dragging left and right. So if I want to trim off the start of the loop, I can do this. Now it sounds like this. The next thing we'll look at is modifiers to adjust loop section length by dragging loop divider notch or item edges. So we're going to go to media item edge, left drag, and I've got this assigned on command control, adjust loop section start end. And so this will work on either the edge of the item, like this, I'll just put that back, or by these handles here, and you should see your mouse change shape to a double square brackets here. And I'm gonna drag that over, and I've changed how frequently this loops now, or kind of the, the loop duration has changed. Uh, let's try it like this. Let's try that a little bit shorter. And of course, I've got this set to snap to my grid, so I can adjust this even finer if I just adjust my grid. So I think this is a really cool addition to Reaper. It may be a little tough to see this. I'm gonna drag this out so we've got that original, got the original um, item here, the original loop point set to there. And let's drag this out, and I'll show you, holding command and control, dragging the edge, how this is actually adjusting the spacing between the items. It's not stretching, it's just kind of spacing things apart, or overlapping them, or not overlapping, or, or kind of, uh, or trimming behind the item if you drag to overlap the items. Really cool, powerful stuff. One more mouse modifier. Add modifier to draw selected media item 
looping the visible or time selected section. So we've had the ability to draw a copy of the selected media item before. So I'll just select this. So I've got this on command. I have this selected and dr draw this out. It actually draws the media item from the edit cursor position. If the edit cursor position is within the item, if it's not, it's just selected, then I can drag out and draw in a, uh, a single item. So let's change this to loop visible or time selected section. So I'm gonna enable that and hit apply. And now let's see, this is one of the looped ones. So I'll copy this one. And so again, it's drawn from the edit cursor position. Let's just make a selection and then draw this out like that. So it's used just the time selected area of the item. So I can select this much, draw that out, and it's automatically looped it. Pretty cool. Let's get rid of all these previously looped ones and let's try this again. So it's, I'll just take this section here. I want to loop that. So I've got it selected. My edit cursor is at the start of the time selection. I will drag this out and it's making a loop of just that section of the original audio item. So that's a really awesome new addition to Reaper's Mess Modifiers. So that's where we're gonna end this video. Thank you so much for watching. If you missed any of these previous What's New in Reaper series videos, there will be a playlist link down below going all the way back to Reaper 5.0. So many amazing new features added to Reaper in the past few years. Uh, really awesome stuff. And I will be making these videos whenever there's an interesting new feature added to Reaper. Please subscribe to the channel if you haven't already. Follow me on Facebook and Twitter. Support the Reaper blog through Patreon and visit reaperblog.net for a lot more tutorials.